else, but in the right place. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Amen. Well, I greet you all in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus. Um, we, we've been looking at um, the doctrine of baptisms, and uh, specifically last week, we, uh, the week before last, we looked at baptism in, into water um, and baptism of the body of Christ, and then we looked last week also at baptism of the Holy Ghost, baptism of the Holy Spirit which I just wanted to look in at a little bit in a little bit more detail before we go on to baptism of, of uh, suffering. Uh, these are the four baptisms that we spoke of that the New Testament basically teaches us about. And um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, just want to look at it maybe in a bit of a historical context as well as how it has affected the church, um, and particularly the Gentile church, which God established after the Lord Jesus um, rose from the dead and um, he ascended, um, he then spoke about the promise of God that would be poured out or given to the world. So if you want to turn to the book of Acts, if you, if you have your Bibles and you want to look at the verses in Acts chapter uh, 2, Acts chapter 2, um, and I want to read in uh, verse 15, or verse 16. Now this is Peter explaining what had happened now, because they, they together at the Feast um, uh, of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, um, and what, what has actually happened is the Holy Spirit has, has come upon these people and they began to, they were gathered together, but there were many people at that time at the feast and close to where the disciples uh, were gathered together. Uh, I, I would assume it would have been just outside the temple that they were gathered together. And God pours his spirit out upon them and they all begin to speak in tongues and speak about the wonderful works of God. And as it happened there in the beginning, when the Holy Ghost was first poured out, uh, they actually spoke in the in the, in the languages of all the peoples that had come together, uh, even though they were Jews, they were speaking in languages that the people that had come together understood. Um, and they spoke of the wonderful works of God. So as the Holy Spirit came upon them, they began to speak about the wonderful things of God. And these people that were gathered together at the feast could hear these people speaking these uh, wonderful things. And, and then Peter now explains to the people, because some of the people stood around and said, well, maybe these people are, are drunken, or maybe there's something strange going on here. And Peter stands up, um, and uh, he says in verse 14, um, but Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above 
and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay. So <clears throat> what Peter is actually referring to here is the outpouring that God said in the last days is going to pour out his spirit upon uh, uh, of his spirit upon all flesh. And this is what now happened as the Holy Spirit came upon these people. So <clears throat> So this was at, at Pentecost. And uh, in, the, in the Jewish calendar, this would have been uh, at the time of uh, the Passover had just taken place. Um, and then they had the Feast of Weeks, which was about 50 days after, after the Passover. Now, the, the, the significant thing of this is that um, when, the, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, uh, Jesus had actually fulfilled those first feasts that, that uh, are spoken about in the Old Testament that the Jews came together to, to celebrate. And there were three feasts, three main feasts that they would come together to celebrate. And that was um, the, the Passover, um, and then uh, the Feast of Weeks, which was Pentecost. And then they would come together at the end of uh, uh, summer in the autumn, um, they would have the feast of um, trumpets, and of tabernacles. So those three times in the year they would they would come together, uh, and Jesus actually fulfilled those first uh, feasts at his first coming. Um, when he came to earth and Jesus actually became the Passover lamb. It was at the Passover that uh, Jesus was uh, crucified. Um, and uh, at that time, then the, the veil in the temple also was, was rent, which was, um, and, and many other great things happened at the time that Jesus died. And on the third day, on the Sunday, he, he rose uh, from the dead and began to appear to his disciples. And the Bible then says from, from uh, the time of the Passover until Pente Pentecost, there's about 50 days. And for 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, um, if you read there earlier in, in, in Acts, um, it says that um, Jesus, for about the period of about 40 days, he spoke to them of... Um, the things of the kingdom of heaven. If you want to read in, in chapter 1, it says uh, in verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive, after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. We looked at that last week in John chapter 14, 15, and, and, and 16, or 14 and 16. Jesus speaks about the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost that he's going to give, because he's going to be taken away. And his disciples was, were sad about this fact that Jesus wasn't going to be with them there anymore physically. But he said, but he will, won't leave them comfortless. He will send another comforter, the promise of the Father, the Spirit of truth. And he will lead them into all truth. So Jesus actually said to them, I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So even though Jesus wasn't there, in, it, or isn't here, we're part of this church age. Even though Jesus isn't here in the flesh, the Holy Spirit is here that reveals the Lord Jesus to us. That's his purpose. His purpose is to speak of the Lord Jesus and to reveal, and he will not, uh, Jesus taught us, he won't speak of himself, but he will receive of me and he will show it unto you. 
So as the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us, we can see the Lord Jesus in our spirit and we can hear his word and we can follow him as our great uh, shepherd. So, so after 40 days, they were gathered together for about another 10 days. And then the, the, the Feast of uh, Pentecost, um, the Feast of Weeks, uh, and the Feast of the, the um, First Fruits. And the, the First Fruits actually started there at the Passover as well, which is interesting because Jesus, the Bible teaches us, is the First Fruits of the Resurrection. So, so when the Holy Ghost came upon them at Pentecost, the apostles spoke mightily, the Bible says, of the resurrection of Jesus. So they spoke and pointed everyone to the first fruits of the harvest. And obviously the challenge went out to the people to come and be part of the harvest of God because Jesus had been resurrected and he was sitting at the right hand of God. And now there's a possibility for us to follow him and follow in his footsteps. So, so this was really, so if we go through the year here yeah, from, um, from January uh, to, to December, the, the Jewish calendar works like that. So their summer is actually in July, they're in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, spring was where uh, we generally have autumn, they had spring, and there were, there were the, the lambs were born, and the grain harvest started coming in, in the springtime. And, and what you had in this early period over here, what you had in this, this early period of, of uh, uh, spring was you had um, the early... The early rain, and then in the in the you basically got, got this long hot summer, um, and and what what the Jews actually say is when the water falls in spring and they get some rain, they probably get as much as what you get here in Longaban, <laughs> which is about as much as what we're getting in Cape Town now as well. Uh, when when they the uh, uh, Israel is a very hilly country, and so when the rain falls in spring, it, it goes into the mountains, and it and it forms. Um, uh, springs, underground springs, and the people are able to draw uh, from uh, water from um, the, the Jordan and from these springs that uh, come and from the sea, um, uh, from the Jordan River and from the springs that, that are underground. So, and they actually call this, this water that falls, they, they, they actually call it this, this underground water they call And then at the end uh, of the season in autumn again, you have, you have the latter rain. Which happens just before the Feast of Trumpets and of Tabernacles. So there's a latter rain and the harvest at the end of the year is a harvest of, of fruit uh, and the fruit trees. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a harvest at the beginning and there's a harvest at the end. And this, the, this uh, long, hot summer is, is also a reference to, um, to the church age or to the age of the Gentiles, which is interesting because James actually speaks about in his, in James' epistle, he speaks about the early rain and the latter rain. And he says, and the husbandman is patient, waiting for the, the fruit of uh, the earth. And he's patient from the early to the latter rain. So in the beginning, the, the rain, obviously, and the water speaks of uh, the Word of God. And it speaks of the Holy Spirit um, as well. Uh, Jesus said, uh, if any man uh, thirst, let him come to me. And as the scripture said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Of living water. This spake of the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him uh, should receive. So, um, and, and he also says to that woman at the well, before he spoke about that, the woman at the well, he's, he's speaking to her and he says to her, um, if, you, if you receive my words and you receive me and you receive my words into you, it'll be in you 
a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Okay, so he said, now if you receive me, and that Samaritan woman is talking now to the Messiah, she's talking to the Lord Jesus, and Jesus is revealing himself, and, and we can actually go and have a look at that maybe at a later stage. He's revealing himself through the gifts of the Holy Ghost to her, and she's believing on him. And he says, you know, if you believe in, on me and you, you receive my words, it'll be in you. Oh, this part, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, sorry, okay. Uh, where was I? Uh, the Samaritan woman, yeah. Uh, Jesus, and he says to her, the, the, if you receive the words that, are, that, are, that are, I'm giving you, it will be in you a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. So she goes back to a city in Samaria, and she starts to tell the people and says, come and see a man which told me all things that ever I've done. So out of her is now beginning to flow living water. Uh, and they receive her word and believe her word and they come and say they want to see themselves and hear themselves about this man, um, the Lord Jesus. So there's a difference between a spring springing up into everlasting life and rivers of living water, isn't that? So when you receive the Lord Jesus as your savior and you receive him, you have a spring springing up unto everlasting life. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, there are rivers of living water that are going to come out of your being. Isn't that wonderful? So you're going to receive power to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. So, uh, so God has poured out at, at Pentecost, he, he poured out the early rain. He poured out of his spirit upon all flesh. And uh, that began the church age. And he said that, you know, your sons and your daughters will prophesy and they will uh, see visions um, and he'll pour out of his spirit on his servants and on his handmaids until the end of the church age, because he, he then goes on to speak of the, the moon turning to blood and the earth, uh, the, the sun going black as sackcloth um, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So before... Um, the end comes and this time of trumpets and uh, of, of uh, tabernacles is really a reference to Jesus' second coming when the trumpets of war will sound and, and God will begin to shake the earth and he will deal again with the, with the Jewish people. Um, and the earth, will, the, the, the moon will turn to, to blood and the sun will not give a light. So God is going to shake the earth. There are going to be earthquakes and, and, and volcanoes and tremendous earthquake. And as we read in Revelation, as a sixth seal is, is open, um, and suddenly there's a multitude of people standing in heaven. And the people of God on the earth, the tribes of Israel, are sealed in their foreheads for that time of Jacob's trouble, or the time of great tribulation that is coming upon the earth. So... Um, so we as the children of God now in the church age, um, what has happened is Jesus has ascended up into heaven. So he's seated on the right hand of God, but he's poured out his spirit, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit upon the earth. So now during this time, the Holy Spirit is actually here with us. The Holy Spirit is here with us during the church age. And uh, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So as the Holy Ghost was poured out, the church received the, the, the Holy Ghost. Uh, and then um, Jesus said, when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit is here and he's reproving the world, the Gentiles, of sin and of righteousness and judgment. And uh, Paul, uh, Peter now talks to the people later on and he says, and we are witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has sent and given to them that obey him. 
and that want to witness for him, that want to witness for him. So Jesus actually fulfills the first feast uh, in his first coming, and he's going to fulfill the, uh, the other feasts, the trumpets and the tabernacles, at his second coming, which is the autumn or the end of, of time. Jesus is going to come again, and uh, particularly he's going to deal with the Jews. And the Jews will again flee into the wilderness like they did uh, when they left Egypt and went into the wilderness. They'll go into the wilderness and they'll actually dwell in, in, uh, in tents again. In, in, and in caves and in tents, like they did at that time, at the Feast of, of Tabernacles. So I just wanted to put that in a, in a sort of, um, in the plan of God, and, and in a historical perspective as well. If we understand that the Holy Spirit is here, that is given to us as the church, um, and uh, then we will also understand the plan of God, and uh, why things are the way they are, on the earth at the moment. Um, during this, this um, Gentile period, um, which is really coming to an end now, as we see the signs of the times um, and, and what's happening in the world, um, there's been a, a massive outpouring, not only of the Holy Spirit upon us in the last, in the last days, and that really... If you, if you look at the, the church age, if we can maybe just put, it, put the church age like that. <clears throat> In the beginning, you had the early rain upon the church. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Um, and at the same time, there was a great attack against the church from uh, the wicked one and from the religious people. So the church was actually taken and put into jail and they were persecuted. And, and at, at about um, 300... 350, um, there was a world leader who was the Caesar at the time called Constantine, <clears throat> and Constantine actually decided that this Christian message was actually a good message, um, and that the, the, the church should actually be legalized, and the Christian uh, church should actually be legalized, and actually should be incorporated into the, the government and into the world uh, leadership structures. Uh, so Christianity was, in a sense, legalized, but at the same time it was compromised. And, and, and around, about, um, around about 900 AD, um, the, the, the church had become so religious and uh, so separate from the normal general population of the world uh, that there were only priests that were allowed to study the Word of God. So the normal people on the street weren't allowed to, allowed to read God's Word, and they weren't allowed to study it, and they weren't allowed to propagate the, the Word of God. And in fact, they had to pay priests to get their sins forgiven and to hear something from God. And at, at that time, a group were, uh, rose up that were called A group that protested against this religious hierarchy and this, this religious establishment. So they protested against it and they began to translate the word of God into the normal languages of the people. Um, and so they were called Protestants because they were protested. They protested. And this movement became, um, became stronger and stronger. Let's just move our timeline on here. Yeah? And, and, and what actually happened there was the blood actually flowed of these people that stood up against the establishment um, until about the 18th century. The Protestant church had actually become so strong and uh, had become involved in so many government structures that it was, it was really unquenchable. It couldn't be... Uh, the Catholic Church didn't have the power to quench it or to bring it to, to nothing. Um, and and um, guys like Luther and Wycliffe and Tyndale and others, they, they translated the Word of God into the languages of the people and distributed it amongst the people. 
<clears throat> and from from that time uh, up until about the 20th century, uh, many missionaries went out from Protestant countries into into the world uh, and and into the amongst the barbarians and the people that lived in the in the in the uh, far out places of the world, preaching the gospel. And so missionaries were sent um, to those places. And these missionaries were mainly they were mainly Calvinists. So um, they had received the word of God, but uh, that they they were they were uh, Lutherans and uh, Methodists. Wesley's followers and so forth, they'd received the word of God, but as they went, they didn't particularly preach about uh, baptism uh, that people need, needed to be baptized, unless they had heard the word of God for the first time and they needed to be, they needed to, to change. Um, then they were baptized as, as adults. And they didn't particularly talk about the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit either. They didn't bring that teaching. So, but as they went, they preached the gospel they, they told people that Jesus had came, Jesus had died for them, um, and many of them died for, for taking that message into, into the world. Um, and they taught the people to, uh, to read the Bible, so they translated the Bibles into the languages of the people and uh, taught them um, uh, just basic sciences and basic education. Uh, they taught the people to wear clothes because often where they went, people just didn't wear clothes. They didn't worry about wearing clothes. They taught them to come together on, on Sundays and to, to study God's word and to, to worship God. Uh, but they didn't particularly preach about baptism and about um, receiving the Holy Spirit. And then at a, at a, at a specific date, we'll take it further here, in uh, 1906, there was a great revival called the Azusa the Azusa Street Revival in America, where uh, in a, a particular church, people had come together and what happened to them was the Holy Spirit fell upon them like it did in the early church. And these people began to speak in tongues uh, and, and prophesy, and they began to be used by God in a way that hadn't been seen uh, before. And uh, the the, the impact of that began to spread throughout the world. And, and churches uh, like <clears throat> uh, the Assemblies of God and uh, AFM and the uh, what was different about these churches uh, that came from that outpouring of the Holy Spirit was they were called Pentecostal churches. Um, and that word Pentecostal means that they believed in the infilling and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So they were called Pentecostal churches, and they were also used in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So in other words, they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and um, they were used in, 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 in miracles and in healings. <clears throat> so this, this message now of the Holy Spirit began to be propagated by these churches and they also sent missionaries uh, and went and, and took the gospel into the world. Um, this is what we refer to here as the latter rain. God is pouring out his spirit. Why? Well, when the enemy comes in like a, a flood, the Bible says the spirit of God will raise up a, a standard against him. So as much as what there's been an outpouring of iniquity and iniquity is beginning to abound in the world and there's been a moral falling away in the world, God has at the same time poured out his spirit on his children so that they can stand upon the word of God and stand for the truth and be a light into the world. Um, what also happened in, in 1900 was <clears throat> the churches began to use a different Bible. They began to use new, a new translations of the Bible began to be printed and come out. 
So as much as what iniquity was abounding and, and infiltrating society, so God also at the same time poured his spirit out upon um, people. And about, um, about 30 years ago, in the, in the late 80s, <clears throat> there was another group uh, of churches that came into being that were called the Charismatic Church. Um, and it, it seemed that the, the, the emphasis had changed into, uh, in, the ch in the church context in the world, the emphasis changed into having massive meetings with uh, um, huge buildings and having much um, material possessions in the, in the church. And then also a, a huge emphasis on um, the, the way people gathered together and the way in which they worship God and the uh, emotional content of, of, that, of those gatherings. So this movement started about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and they also um, emphasized the Holy Spirit. But some of the things that they emphasized about the Holy Spirit and about Pentecost were not... What, the early, what we see in the early church. So there were strange signs and strange manifestations of uh, the Spirit being poured out upon people and the way they responded to this, the Spirit being poured out upon them. So <clears throat> this is really where we've, where we've come to in the world and in the church uh, history. Um, and it leaves us with the question of, well, where, where are we and what does God uh, expect from us? And what does the Lord Jesus um, desire from us as believers? As we see, there's so much, uh, there's, there's been so much deception that has come upon the world and upon the church. Um, and there's been so much uh, groups going astray after this way and that way. What does the Bible what is the Bible really for us? It's meant to be. It's meant to be a foundation for the children of God to be able to say, this is the way, this is what God has given us, this is what God has taught, and this is what we're going to stand on. And what did Jesus say? If you, if you hear my words and you do them, you will be like unto a, a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the storms came and the floods came and that house could not be moved because it was founded upon a rock. So how do we receive the latter rain? How do we receive the Holy Ghost? Um, and how are we led by God? And we just want to look at that in a bit more detail because, uh, well, Lord willing, maybe next week we'll look at that. How are people led by the, the Holy Ghost? Um, it speaks of people prophesying and uh, uh, people seeing visions and people dreaming dreams. How are we led by God and how do we know that we're being led by God? It's important for us to, to know that. Firstly, let's just look at Matthew chapter 18. It's obvious that God wants to use us, and it's obviously that God wants to fill us, and not just half fill us, but He wants to be completely one with us. Jesus didn't die to, to, to bring us into a distant relationship with God, but the, 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 the doctrine of baptism is actually a doctrine of immersion. So God wants me to be immersed into Jesus Christ, immersed into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. God wants my life to show that forth. Um, he doesn't want me to receive the Holy Spirit just in, in measure or in a small part, but he wants me to be full of the Holy Ghost. He wants rivers of living water to, to pour out of, of me. Um, 
And firstly, what needs to, to happen is Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, It says, uh, uh, and, he, and said, Verily I say unto you, or truly I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. Now, similar, similar thing that Jesus says to uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going off in that. In that. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is ministering. That's why you can't see a person. <laughs> John chapter 3. Um, uh, Nicodemus is a religious man and is a man now that has studied the law of God and he studied the Old Testament and the feasts and all these things. Um, and he is teaching that to the people. Or well, the people are coming to him for instruction and direction. And he says to Nicodemus um, in verse 3, well, let's read verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus says to him, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, who, who is the kingdom of God? Jesus is the kingdom of God. The Bible says that when we baptize into Jesus, we translate it not just into Jesus, but into the kingdom of his dear son. So that's strange when you think about it, because a kingdom normally has a king, and the king is separate from the kingdom. But Jesus is so big and so great that he actually encompasses his whole kingdom. His whole kingdom can fit inside of him. That's how big our God is. Uh, but who reveals the kingdom of God? Who reveals Jesus Christ? It's the, the Holy Spirit. It, Jesus is actually saying to Nicodemus, yeah, the Holy Spirit cannot reveal me to you unless you're born again. Unless you become, unless you're converted and become like a little child and humble yourself and receive the Word of God. So when we want to uh, receive the Holy Ghost, we've got to just become like a little child. And so this is what God wants from me. When we receive the Word of God, we've just got to become like a little child. And so this is what God is saying. I'm going to respond and do what God says. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, similar, similar references One Corinthians, well, let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 first. In verse uh, 14 of um, chapter 3, it says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon or upon the foundation, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, so as by fire. Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, 
For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive you. If any among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, it takes the wise in their own craftiness. If any man seems to be wise in this world, let him become as a fool. Let him become as a little child. Let him be converted. Let him become born again. And you go back to chapter 2. And um, it says in verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay, so he said, um, he didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. He says in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden mystery which God hath ordained before the world, and to our glory. So the wisdom of God is above the wisdom of this world. And by God's wisdom, he has overcome the, the devil and his works. So firstly, we need to, in order to receive what God wants us to do and how he wants us to be part of that latter reign and how he wants us to live our lives, we have to have a heart like a, like a child, and we need to leave our intellect or our own understanding behind and say, this is what God's Word says, this is what God's Word teaches, this is what Jesus taught, and this is what the apostles taught, and I want to walk in that way. You know, God says that is wisdom, but not the wisdom of this world, that, that is the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that comes from above. Okay, let's just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 now. <clears throat> so Paul first has to deal with all the, the, the sort of problems that have crept into this church group that have come together and then uh, establish them on a foundation and teach them how to hear from God and how to receive God's wisdom and how to walk together with one another and how to apply themselves in the world. If you read 1 Corinthians up to chapter 12, you'll see that that's what uh, this book is, is about. And then he gets to chapter 12, which is about the gifts of the, of the uh, Holy Spirit. Um. Let's just read there from chapter. Am I moving away? Let's re read there from chapter twelve and um, verse four. It says there now there are diversities. Well, let's just read verse three as well. If I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Those are the gifts of the, the Holy Ghost. But there is one Holy Spirit. There are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. These are the ministries. There are ministries of the Lord Jesus, but there is one Lord Jesus. It says there are diverse, and there in verse 6, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So, this is the operations that we're involved in as believers are fellowship, prayer, breaking of bread, um, and the study of God's word, and reaching out to the lost. These are the operations of God. God is involved in operating in His bride, the church, God the Father, 
and is involved in operating in people's lives to bring them into life, into Jesus Christ. One Father, one Spirit, one Lord. It says in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So one Spirit is working in us, the Holy Spirit is working in us, and is dividing to every person severally as he desires. The gifts of the Holy Ghost are given to every believer to profit with all for the working of God in the church and for the salvation of souls. Um, so we all, th this is God's desire that we should all be full of the Spirit of God. God wants each one of us to uh, know the fullness of um, being filled with God. If we go there to um, chapter 14, so uh, as I said, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles. So he's actually bringing us as Gentiles, well, not us so much, but them in the beginning, because a lot of us have come out of traditional churches and out of charismatic churches, and we've maybe heard these things in Sunday school or in youth or wherever or at church. We've heard some of these teachings and our lives have become aligned with many of the things in the scriptures. Um, but Paul actually is, is teaching the Gentiles how to enter into the fullness. So he's got an apostolic ministry specifically for the Gentiles. So when you read Peter's epistle and James and John, their ministries were specifically applied to the Jews. Um, but Paul's ministry specifically as an apostolic ministry is applied to the Gentiles. So Paul is really like a father figure to the Gentile church. And he says that uh, in, in uh, some of his epistles as well. He says, um, you have many instructors, but not many fathers, because I have begotten you unto this life that you're in. Um, so <clears throat> Paul says here um, in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I would that you all spake with tongues. Just the first part of that verse. Paul's desire is that we should all speak with tongues. That's his desire. What is the benefit of speaking in tongues? Well, he that speaks in, in an unknown tongue, the Bible says, edifies himself. He builds himself up because he's speaking in the spirit mysteries to, to God. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies or builds himself up. Do you think we need to be built up in these days that we, we live in? And with the onslaught that is against us as a church specifically, um, I think we need to be built up. So, so the gifts of the Holy Ghost are really made available to, to all of us. If you go to verse, in the same chapter, verse um, 31, He said, for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. You may say, say to the believers, yeah, you may all prophesy. Not one is excluded. One by one, when you have the Lord Jesus in you and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you are able to, to prophesy. And we'll maybe look at that prophecy, what it actually means, because people get confused about what prophecy means. Lord willing, we'll look at that in a bit more, more detail. Um, but just to say this, that um, 
Jesus said in that, we looked at that in, in Luke chapter 11. He said that if any of you being a father and your son comes and asks you for, for bread, will you give him a, a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? And he said, and if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, because you care for them, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask of Him? So if you ask for the Holy Spirit and you come in childlike faith and say, well, I want to have this and I want to be able to speak in tongues and I want to be able to prophesy and I want to be a witness for, for Christ. If you ask for it, God's not going to give you something else if you're coming to Him in the name of the Lord Jesus. But He's going to give good gifts unto His children. And he's going to give the fullness of what you can receive. God wants what's best for you. He wants you to have, he wants you to enter into his plan and have the full equipment that you need to be able to accomplish that. Um, you know, I remember when I first got saved and I was, uh, there was a tremendous weight on me and a tremendous struggle that I was going through. And looking around at the world and saying, you know, how is it that there's so few that know this? How is it that there's so few that are walking in this way? And I, and I felt like I wasn't strong enough to do anything for God or to make a difference in the world. And I remember having a, a dream um, of myself pushing a car. And there was a hang of a long journey that we had to go. And I was pushing the car. And the thought came to me when I woke up was, why am I pushing the car when the car's got an engine to power it. And in the same way, when we desire to be a witness for Jesus, and we desire to make an impact for God, why struggle in our own strength when we can receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us to be witnesses for, for God? And you know, uh, I, I sought the Lord for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I prayed for it on a number of occasions. And I think uh, after I'd been... Uh, Serving the Lord for a year or two, I received the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and definitely something happened and something changed. And not, not just my testament, but many people that I've spoken to. You know, in, in, in coming to the Lord and realizing how far I was away from God and how my life had, had been an, an absolute um, abomination to God. When I came to Jesus and, and I received the Lord Jesus as my Savior, I said, and God said to me, now I want you to serve me. I said to the Lord, you know what, Lord? I'm powerless to serve you. I'm finished. You've got the wrong man. You've got the wrong guy. <laughs> but God persisted. And he said, no, I want you. I want you. And I want you to serve me. And I said, but I'm powerless, Lord. I can do nothing for you. I'm a wreck. I'm finished. I've done nothing good in your sight. And the Lord said, that's fine. I will empower you. I will give you power to be a witness for me. I will fill you with my spirit so that you're not just saved and you're not just born again, but you are actually empowered by me as well. So all I can do today is say literally, Lord, I can only give you the glory for, because I am what I am by the grace of God, only by his grace. And the things that I've done, I've not done in my power but I've done because Christ has strengthened me and because the Holy Ghost has given me power. Sorry, I moved away again. <laughs> you need to tie me to this pillar like, like Samson. <laughs> Amen. So we'll just leave it at that and then, Lord willing, we'll see how we'll go on next week. Um, but let's just, uh, let's just leave it uh,